Good morning. I'm Julia Ryan, the Associate Director for Clinical Market Development for Convitec. Thank you for joining us uh, here this morning, and thank you to all of those uh, who have joined us virtually. Uh, I uh, will be here today, this morning. I have the privilege of being with Stacy Zerbin, uh, who is the licensed nursing home administrator for the Friendship Village Sunset Hill Skilled Nursing Facility in St. Louis, Missouri. Friendship Village is a not-for-profit life care community and was nationally recognized as the first Pathway Health National Center of Excellence in January 2020. Stacy has earned multiple leadership awards, uh, including the American College of Healthcare Administrators Eli Pick Facility Leadership Award, which uses objective data to identify high-performing skilled nursing facilities and the leaders that drive that excellence. Stacy is certified as an Interact Champion and has also received the Leading Age of Missouri Visionary Award. We're here to talk uh, with you today about breaking away from the pack, achieving efficiency in your wound care delivery and clinical outcomes in a value-based world. So when we look at the stressors that post-acute providers deal with every day, First is staffing challenges. You can't really open uh, an industry uh, newsletter without hearing about staffing shortages. And these were problems that U.S. providers were having 18 months ago, uh, and they've only been exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, there was a survey uh, earlier this month where 60% uh, of skilled nursing facility respondents reported that they were filling vacancies with agency staff. And 40% reported that actually at some point they had to uh, halt new admissions because they didn't have the staff to take care of those uh, admissions. Regulatory survey. So uh, wounds, particularly pressure injuries, continue to, to be a subject of your survey scrutiny. And so the uh, F 686 treatment and services uh, to prevent and heal pressure ulcers at the scope and severity of G or higher are still continuing. And we saw a dip a little bit in 2020, but it, uh, that was, of course, because uh, surveys probably were a bit less during that time, but they're starting to ramp up to uh, 2019 levels. So that is always there. And Surveyors are always very keen on making sure that you have processes in place for wound care and that you're doing it, particularly in this current environment, in a very uh, effective way to uh, maintain infection control. On the reimbursement front, uh, PDPM and PDGM, I think, helped uh, providers because it gave you um, some additional reimbursement for those complex patients that you were already taking care of. So there was a recognition of some of the costs that was associated with taking care uh, of those patients. Uh, I think we'll see Medicare reimbursement begin to transition from the fee-for-service that we, we may be accustomed to under Medicare to a more value-based. That's coming uh, right in the uh, you know, horizon uh, for you, and understanding well, you know, what does value-based purchasing mean uh, is going to be an important thing uh, for your operations. Also impacting reimbursement certainly is Medicare Advantage. Uh, we have seen uh, an increase over the years. Uh, the data that I have is last from 2016, but about the national average of uh, individuals who were signing up for Medicare Advantage was about 29%. And in some states, you know, again, that's the average, but in some states you could have as high as 40% who are being managed uh, under a managed Medicare program. So challenges, because we know that, you know, you're not going to get the same uh, reimbursement that you might have got under traditional Medicare, and you may have to work a little bit for it. Uh, you may get some denials, you may see some what you might consider premature discharges. So again, another challenge under reimbursement. On top of that are a number of different factors as it relates to wound care. You have diverse products that are in your facility uh, in the various categories. Uh, you, know, you have multiple vendors who are providing uh, those products, and it's how do you know which one to use. Inconsistent care protocols. Again, unless you have 
uh, those protocols in place or you're working with uh, collaborating with other professionals who are helping you with that, you may have individual clinicians taking care of wounds the way that you know, they know how. Site of care variation with multiple providers. So um, sometimes you're collaborating with other providers to, to provide wound care, whether it's an outpatient wound, uh, wound care center or you may have a consultant group that comes into your facility. Making sure that there's collaboration you know, with those outside entities can be challenging. Inefficient care processes. Do you know how you are acquiring your products uh, into the facility? How does that work? Do you have the right partnerships um, with your distributors and, and other stakeholders uh, in your success? Then there's the patient. Uh, you know, we, we are dealing with patients and residents who have, you know, multiple comorbidities, chronic conditions, and we know that if we don't manage those, you know, we can use the most expensive, you know, effective products, but we may still have challenges in healing those wounds. Mismanaged wound bio burden. So again, understanding what the impact of uh, things like uh, biofilm may be in delaying that wound healing. You may be doing all the right things. You have great nutrition program in, great interdisciplinary team that's helping you uh, to uh, write the care plan, but you may still see these wounds just not progressing. And you might want to think about that you know, impact of the, uh, the bio burden within the wound. Lack of communication on wound progress. Once we have multiple stakeholders in the process, whether it's a wound care center, whether it's a, uh, an attending physician outside of your facility or outside of your agency, you know, there's always that uh, challenge of making sure that you're communicating effectively with them, but also the family. You need to make sure that you are connecting with the family and that they are aware of the, the care that you're providing uh, and you know, how that's being provided. And then again, you, know, you may have wounds in your, uh, either your home health agency or your facility that when they came to you, that wound was two years old already and, and hadn't really healed. So how do you manage getting that wound out of that stalled wound healing. The stat at the bottom of the slide, Medicare spending, this is actually um, back to 2014 data, um, but Medicare spending on all wound types, you know, ranged from uh, 28 to $96 billion. That's a huge difference, you know, in that, uh, in that scale. So we're, the money is being spent. Are we seeing the outcomes, uh, the positive outcomes of that spending? Uh, I'm not sure that we are. So how do you manage uh, the challenges that you're facing every day uh, in delivering uh, cost-effective wound care? And so we collaborated uh, with our post-acute care partners to try to understand uh, you know, what they were dealing with on a daily basis and how we as a product manufacturer could partner with them uh, to help to deal with those challenges. And so what you see here is, is the outline of the Convitec Complete Program. And it actually is made up of a number of different pillars. And all of these things need to work together in order to uh, make a program successful. So the first pillar is product standardization. Again, uh, standardizing to uh, a Combatech formulary of products to help you optimize consistency in using uh, the appropriate uh, advanced wound care products so that you're able to get uh, clinical and financial outcomes that are consistent. Acquisition, again, you have to work with your distributors to be able to get product and that's sometimes looking to be a challenge as we look at uh, supply chain issues that are affecting all products uh, you know, that we need, but certainly uh, medical products are part of that. So making sure that you're working with your supplier, distributor, whoever is getting you your products to understand how your products are coming in, how the ordering process works, 
and really leveraging those partners and their reporting capabilities because they, they are able to generate reports about what you're using uh, on a, a monthly basis and you can look at those reports and review those reports with your partners to be able to say, you, you may have some product creep, you know, some products that are coming in that aren't necessarily on your formula and you can catch that right away. So looking at those reports that they provide is really important. Then portfolio management. So there are a lot of stakeholders in your wound care practice, regardless of, of which setting you're in. You may have, you have the providers, the individuals who are writing the orders, and they may be in your facility, they may be outside of your facility, they may be in a wound care center. And your distributors, your billers, your payers, all of those stakeholders are, are need to be involved in working to uh, use the formulary that you've chosen and make sure that you are uh, sticking to that formulary. Education, huge, right? When we talked about staffing shortages, it almost seems like once you get people trained, they're on to their next position. So making education simple and very intuitive is important. And using multiple methods to do that, whether it's on-site, virtual, on-demand, QR code driven to videos, whatever uh, works for your particular staff in that particular situation, Variety is key here because it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. And then really, last but certainly not least, that wound management. How are we taking care of those wounds in a consistent way so that no matter which clinician in the facility because you, or home health agency, because you don't always have the wound care nurse or the wound care expert um, that's helping you with these wounds. So how do we empower all the clinicians in your facility to feel comfortable taking care of wounds. And I was teasing Stacy, it's, you know, when the surveyor comes, it's not like, oh my gosh, who's gonna do the wound care, you know, in front of the surveyor? Because, you know, you're not really sure what the competencies are of the individual nurses. Getting everybody on the same page, using consistent protocols in an effective way is key to the success of the Convitec Complete program. So with that, I think I'm going to ch change it over to my partner, Stacy, to tell you about her facility's experience with the program. So good morning, everybody. I'm Stacy Zurban. Um, I've been an administrator for 20 years. Um, live locally in St. Louis, work at Friendship Village of Sunset Hills. Um, as Julia mentioned, we are a life plan community. There are two life plan communities in Missouri, and what that is, it's, it's basically um, an insurance plan that um, people invest in at the independent living, and then their cost as they move through the continuum of care is a predictable cost. Um, so we, when we started this program, we were at 118 beds, and in January we opened up a brand new 144 bed skilled nursing facility on our campus. Our original building was 42 years old, so um, our residents were excited to get an upgrade, right? Um, so on our campuses, we have FB at Home, which is private duty, and Medicare Home Health. We have short-term residency. We have assisted living and memory care. Uh, we have our skilled nursing and rehab buildings, and we also have on-site urgent care clinics. So we have a 48-bed designated short-term uh, rehab floor, and we have the preferred partnerships with all the major hospitals. And so I think in being in this business um, for a very long time, we finally have a seat at the table with the decision makers, right? Hospitals never wanted to talk to administrators, right? That's not anything uh, that they made an initiative for their hospital system. And now we have a partnership, we're exchanging data, we're talking about wins and losses when it comes to care of the residents. So it certainly has um, come to a point where I think that now we have true partnership in taking care of our residents. So I did two things that were pretty crazy in 2020. Uh, 
I moved into a brand new building first thing in 2021, and I asked my director of nursing to look at a wound care program in the middle of a pandemic. So that's scary, right? Because your director of nursing in a pandemic probably has other things to worry about than changing our wound care program. So um, when Teresa Slinker came to me to talk about a pilot program, she wanted obviously to have the clinical team there. And I said, well, we're in, we're in a COVID surge right now. I can't pull them away from taking care of residents, but let's have a meeting and tell me about what you want to do. And so as we'll talk about, a couple things stood out in our initial conversation. One is a rec recognition that there is a staffing shortage. So what, it, what can we do to, use, to work smarter, not necessarily harder, right? When she asked me, what is your current cost of wounds? I had zero idea. Because to me, it was a necessary evil. You have to take care of people. So the cost necessarily didn't matter, right? It was, it was our commitment to the resident to take care of their wounds. Education is huge. Um, Julia stole my thunder a little bit, but I can tell you that we don't do wound care nurses um, in our building. We expect all of our nurses to be confident and competent in taking care of the wounds. They're the ones that are going to be talking at the bedside with the resident and the family. Um, and so we've never bought into having a wound care nurse in our building. Why? Because what happens when they go on vacation? No one knows what to do, right? Um, and so the education stood out to me. But the barrier was how can we do all this education when we're in a pandemic and we can't really have our staff come in, right, if they're not working, because there was a whole segregation of we only allow people working in. So how are we going to launch this program? So the education piece was huge for me. Um, and so reducing cost, that was the end game for an operator, but it wasn't why I got interested in this program. It truly was increasing our quality at the bedside, inc increasing our level of service that we were able to give, and making all of our nurses rock stars in wound care, not just one or two that had the certification. So our objective was just to look at a different way. And I tell everybody, we have wound protocols in our building, right? Everybody had the protocol, use this for this type of wound. But there's never been a wound program that had all the important people at the table to launch this. And that's the difference between what this is to what I've used over the years, is that this is truly a program that takes into consideration all the important things that we never looked at before and truly creating a team approach. Some of you might say, why on earth is the administrator at the table for something clinical? Well, I own all the good and bad experiences in the building, right? And I have to speak to them, not only in the surveyor's conversation, but also to families. So um, I tend to be a pretty hands-on administrator. I am not a nurse, FYI, for questions. But um, I want to know what's going on. And I also know the burden um, that people felt in taking care of wounds. And I've never felt that. I've always felt that if your staff were competent, if they were trained appropriately, it comes down to a physician order and, and following your policies and procedures. So wounds were nothing I was scared of taking. But once again, this gave us a team approach. Um, including our medical director. Um, and we'll talk later how she is such a pivotal role in this. And medical directors often aren't the expert in wounds, right? Sometimes they defer to your nurse or they want to go get an outside opinion or have another company come in. So we had to create our own experts in the building. And so this program allowed us to do that. So how are we going to get there? Well, we had to have a toolkit, and an organized, deliberate method of where we were and where we needed to go. We needed to, to utilize the Lean Six Sigma for getting our materials management in order, those supply closets, which we'll take a look at. And where, where we started, we had to assess. Like I said, I had no idea what the days to heal were. I had no idea how much money I was spending I had no idea how many SKUs I were using. 
that's something that I just thought was a necessary evil in taking care of our residents. And then creating this clinical pathway in a standardized process to deliver care at the bedside. Creating a simple virtual tools. How many have used your QR codes all throughout this week, right? Everything, scan a QR code for a menu, scan a QR code to register for maybe this class, right? QR codes um, have been a way that we've been able to survive during the pandemic. So for them to incorporate the QR codes in our education and training was spot on. Um, using the SBAR for communication, I know our medical director kept saying, I get tons of calls, usually at 10 o'clock at night, for the one nurse that wants to change a dressing. And we all know, right? Yeah, yeah. And they didn't give a very good description. And so the medical director or the following physician had to make an educated guess, and so orders got changed, right? And so then the next nurse comes on. She doesn't like that dressing change because she's more of an expert than the other person, and she calls the medical director again have another order change, right? That happens, right? So creating a pathway also gave our medical director and our physicians a pathway to follow as well. And it was very deliberate and organized. And train the trainer approach. So we all use that in every day, we've heard that, but what does it really mean during a pandemic? We were able to use our clinical pathways and able to show, take one of our champions, our wound care certified nurses, who he's a um, day supervisor, he became the champion of the program. So he went through and did competencies, figured out what people were comfortable and weren't comfortable with, and went through our pathways to show how to use the, the products efficiently. And then, as a resource, they have the QR codes, which we'll look at later under the education piece, to go back to. Um, for support. So here's all the, uh, the pieces of the puzzle. And like I said, this is different. I, I tell you, when we pick out, before this program, when we picked out what wound care programs to use, I think all the clinical team got around a six foot table and we had two choices and you pass out the program and they said, oh, Stacy, we're going with this. We're gonna go with whatever company. Okay, but we never had the central supply manager at the table. We never had the ADON or educator at the table necessary. We never really made sure that our medical supply company could get the products that we chose, right? So having everybody appropriate at the table means you can launch this program quickly and efficiently. So product standardization, as I walk through the exhibit hall, there's a lot of products. I had no idea, right? And, um, and I'll show you how embarrassed I am about that, but we had 28 different products that we used um, throughout taking care of the wounds, 28 different SKUs, so to speak. And we were able to reduce that to 11, a basic um, 11 that we have in our program to use. So standardization became key. Once our nurses understood there's a roadmap and we weren't gonna go outside, we weren't gonna go across the lane, we were gonna stick to our path, there's always instances where something's not healing using what I call our basic three products, but we also have others that we can go um, and use, but that had to be approval with our wound care champion and our director of nursing. So they didn't get access to all 11 SKUs that we picked, they got access to four of our most used SKUs, and then if we needed to advance in that, we had a conversation and as a team, we decided what the best treatment was. Everybody had this one closet in your house that you probably looked at, you think you're gonna clean out and you just don't get it, right? Yeah, so I'm pretty proud of this. This was our, <laughs> so this was our closet. So no wonder there's inefficiencies in delivering a care when how do you find what you're looking for, right? Proud, proud mom moment, as I say. Um, so one of the key things in launching a program is you have to make it super easy for people to use. I know nurses, and I know there's no nurses like this in this room, so I only have them in St. Louis. But if it's hard to find, then they'll make any excuses not to follow a program, yes, right? So this 
cause confusion in what we are trying to do. This is how you get wrong uh, treatments on wounds. And this is how you get in trouble with the state because you'll put something that's easily uh, to get and it's the wrong thing and all of a sudden the surveyor's like, well, you didn't file the physician order. And she's like, well, I couldn't find it. So we're gonna take the guesswork out of that and this is what our supply closets look like now. And actually, uh, to this day, we're almost a year into the program. It is very user-friendly, it's very intentional, and it's kept um, with PAR levels. So we aren't gonna put 20 different foams out there. We're gonna put three boxes, and we're gonna manage from there based on our use. So we have more efficiencies. And also, who wouldn't wanna be proficient in wound care when it's easily able to be used? So supply chain, we've heard about this, right? There's a lot of boats out there waiting <laughs> to get off and get shipped to, to different places. So the, the one thing about this program that I appreciated is it talked about where we are in usage. It talked about, okay, we have 11 SKUs, but how did this 12th, how did this 12th one get in there? Who ordered it, who approved it, and how did, how did, we, how did we buy this without there being some sort of um, permission? So looking at cost, looking at usage allows you to be able to establish par values and really able to manage that cost effectively. Portfolio management. So once again, working with all of our providers, our Medicare Part B providers, we need to make sure, can you get this product? Do you have this available? Because we don't want to go outside the lane in our pathways because you can't get the product. So if you want our business, we need you to be able to follow our, follow our protocol. Um, and this is talking about all billers, all payers, making sure that anyone that is writing an order understands what our program and our pathway is. Um, and I will tell you, the first 60 days were a little rough because every nurse that I didn't know was an expert in wounds were an expert because they did not want to use the program. So they were switching things usually after five once we all left, but we caught them every time. Um, <laughs> and once doctors understood that there is an intentional, deliberate program, I think it took a load off their shoulders because they didn't have to be the all, be all decision makers, right? It wasn't all resting on their shoulders. They could lean in and utilize our pathway and feel good about it because they were at the table when it initially started. And then the education. This is huge. Um, to be able to give, and there's a lot of brand new nurses coming out with GPNs, LPNs, and I always kind of think that sometimes our clinical that we give our nurses is kind of a drive-through, right? You just hope something sticks. But a lot of it isn't in depth education and wounds. Um, and then we have people that have been doing it forever and they're really comfortable with some things but not maybe comfortable with new technology or new ways of doing it. So to be able to offer these tools, um, we keep them on our treatment cart so they never leave. So if they have to use it as a resource, they can go back and get educated. If they call our director of nursing at two o'clock in the morning because all of a sudden they forgot how to do something, she can say, use your tools, use your QR code. It's a three minute video, it's a minute 30 video. If you have any questions, call us back. And so that's been able to really empower our nurses um, to understand the why behind what they're doing and why they're using the tools that they are. Um, and, and I do think that there's not a nurse that doesn't want to be proficient in their skill set. Um, in a pandemic, there's just sometimes not enough time, right, to train people appropriately. Um, I think everybody's orientation um, during the pandemic is a little, <laughs> it might be a little lacking. Why? Because everybody was stretched. So this was a great resource, and the education never changed. So it doesn't matter what nurse told you. If you use these resources, the information was consistent and thorough. And these are where the QR codes are. And so each QR code talks about the different product and when you would use that product and how to use that product. So if you think about it, we reduce SKUs. So now if I go and I'm the nurse, 
Gosh, Lord help us if that would ever be the case. But let's just say, and I'm going to Mary and Bob's room, and both of them have the same treatment. Because I'm using the same um, tools, I get better at doing it, right? We all get better at doing things through repetition. And so I feel like where there was a break in confidence is we just had too much noise in our wound care protocol, right? It was just like, oh, well, this person needs this because this doctor ordered this, this person's using this. And so no one got proficient at 20 different wound treatments, but we can be really proficient, you know, with the basic four. And go once again, um, we entered um, into the wound hygiene focus here of late, and that was, an interesting process because I'm gonna give a description. You have to kind of get in there and clean it and you can't be as scared, scared of the wounds, right? And so that was really kind of nerve wracking to newer nurses in the industry because they were afraid they were gonna hurt somebody and they didn't understand the why. And so um, we've really made a lot of gains by, by using wound hygiene in our program. It's been a really great asset to us. And this is my director of nursing, Margie. She looks happy, right? That's good. Happy, happy DONs, happy life. Um, so this is what our training looks like. So you can see that it's right on the med cart and all the tools are right there. So if you have to question or ask how to use a pro, uh, product, it's right there. And it's not hard. This program is not hard. It's actually pretty simple, which is what my staff really found out after we got over the hump a little bit of something new, they really realize that this isn't asking them to do more work. It's asking them to be pr proficient and efficient, which actually makes them feel a lot more confident and there is a lot more employee morale surrounding wounds. Julie, you want to talk about program results? Oh, it is me? Oh, it, it is, is me. Okay, I'm going to talk. I thought it was pictures. Okay, so <laughs> we don't want those pictures. Um, so pre-data, um, to be honest, we didn't have a lot of pressure, but we did have a lot of skin tears. And so just briefly talking about the amount of nursing time every day to do treatments. Um, and our wound cost to heal, the first one, and everybody can see this on the screen, $1,200 and some change to heal a wound. $1,000 again, $621. And then at the bottom where the pressure wounds are, it's a lot of nursing labor. So if you can reduce what is on their to-do list every day and still give quality care, um, it's the residents who win. If the residents don't have to get wound changes every day and still can have wound healing, that resident is gonna have a better quality of life because they don't have to go back to their room instead of going to bingo and get their wound done, right? They can go to bingo and get their wound done in two, two more days. So post data, there's some big differences, right? So we were at 1,000, we were at $1,200, and you could see taking the same type of wound and reducing the nursing visits, I think from 91 was right, right? So now we're doing it every three days. Um, the, the total cost to heal the wounds, as an operator, this speaks to me. But most of all, it speaks to the fact that we're managing our nurses' time better and in a safe manner. This isn't, don't do the wounds every day and we'll just see what happens as a clinical outcome. The nurses were able to see that they could step away and do an every three-day dressing, still get the wound healing, but what a reduction in nursing time that they had to do wounds. So these are the cost comparison of where we were at. Um, and obviously these are, these are great numbers and they continue to be consistent with this. So our total um, nursing time at the next, at this last one, 21 days to heal, which is seven visits um, by our nurse and then the product costs um, $24.50, so our total cost to heal with the nursing labor and the product is $122.50. And I've really never had a wound care program come to me and say, we can save you money, right? So, pretty cool. 
And here's just another example. 14 uh, visits, product cost was $14. The total cost to heal this wound was $70. And last but not least, this wound, seven days to heal, two visits, um, product cost $7. Total cost to heal this room was $35. So big cost savings, not only in the product, but truly the nursing time that it takes out of their day um, to take care of wounds. So the summary of results, we talked about the medical director getting, having an abundance of calls and really reducing that um, effectively. Our documentation we worked on, we didn't really do a very good job describing the wounds um, to where we could get coverage under Medicare Part B. And so now we have that at 100% compliance. Um, our previous average days to heal, a skin tear, was 70, and now it's down to 14. The resident's winning. That's the most important takeaway of this. Um, and the average cost to heal a skin tear was close to $1,000, and that new cost is $69. So the most the effective way is through our standardization, right? Um, and just being purposeful in what we do in our care delivery and reducing those SKUs from 28 to 11. And remember my supply closet, right? Using the Lean Six Sigma and setting up a formulary that truly made sense and educating them on why they were using it. And then we were able to coordinate this program through our whole Friendship Village continuum. So right now it's at assisted living in our home health company. So if I'm discharging a wound to my home health provider, they're using the same protocol. There's no skip in service there. And this is um, our trunk kits that we started for FV at Home, which is our home health care. And this is huge because if you're a home health nurse and you're doing an admission and they have a wound, a lot of times they can't treat the wound because what? We don't have the supplies. So setting up um, these trunk kits have made it really um, a great use of their nurses' time and their staffing. And ultimately, it gets the resident treatment started, and so there's no delay in care. And so that has been a tremendous customer service piece to um, our delivery of care, but also it's a really um, great way to manage the staff. And now the clinical cases. Now, Julia. Thank you so much, Stacy. I, I did ask that your mic be left on because I do want your color commentary here. I wasn't the clinician who took care of these patients. I am reporting as the clinicians have reported to us. So uh, you may have some uh, additional information that you want to share. But no program like this works without outstanding wound care products. And so I just want to share with you some of the results that um, Stacy's facility as well as the home health was able to achieve uh, in, with these protocols. So for this particular patient, this patient had cardiovascular disease, hyperlipidemia, also an adhesive allergy. And so the resident and the family were resistant to the program. This was somebody they felt should be managed by experts. And so it was a lot of uh, working with the facility medical director, working with the patient's attending physician to get buy-in to the program that the facility had implemented and that, you know, help, you know, we'll do this for you, just uh, give us the opportunity. So that collaboration was very important. Yeah, so um, Dr. Brosh, our medical director, so this is where you've turned the corner with your staff, and this was like the first like aha moment for me, is because this um, resident came to us with this injury and orders that were outside of our protocol. And so when we called to get clarification, or we called our medical director, we switched to our current protocol, which would make sense, right? Because she's overseeing the care. And so, as you would, they have follow-up appointments in the wound care program, and the nurse practitioner called and really scoured my staff and asked, why on earth were you using such a terrible protocol? She needs to be on XYZ. I've let the family know. 
you know, you guys aren't the experts, we're the experts, etc. So then the family comes back with, with mom, and you can imagine they weren't feeling so much love for Friendship Village at that time because they thought that we were completely irresponsible um, and, and not competent in taking care of their mom's wounds based on that physician visit. And so my staff calls, Stacy, what are we gonna do? They're not following the protocol. They're not following the protocol. I'm like, this is the same nurse that didn't wanna follow the protocol, but okay, <laughs> we've turned the corner with her. And so they were like, no, 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 this is, this is what this wound needs. We, we, use our, we use our pathway, and I'm like, okay. And so we weren't gonna win um, solving it from my wound care nurse to um, that nurse practitioner. So the difference was my medical director who was at the table from day one, called and spoke to not the nurse practitioner, but the physician that the nurse practitioner worked with. And she said, hey, I want you to know I'm managing um, this resident in our building. I'm looking at her wounds every week. And did you know we had a wound care program? And it was on speakerphone. And the doctor's like, no. And she's like, yes, we have an exact pathway. I'm following it. It's worked. I've seen it work. Um, are you okay with us using the Convitec program? And she's like, yes, if there's a program in place and you're, and you're involved, please follow your program. And you can see the results of that happening. But it's having that advocate sometimes at a higher level that can get some communication done effectively than what our DON or our wound care nurse could have done. Yes, yeah, so this was a, a trauma wound with infection, and so the treatment protocol was with Aquacel AG Advantage covered with the Aquacel foam non-adhesive because this patient had the adhesive allergy, and then that was wrapped with a roll gauze. This wound had been uh, undergoing daily dressing changes, and that was decreased to every three days uh, as well. So you, again, you see the results here. This next patient is a venous leg ulcer. Uh, multiple comorbidities, uh, peripheral venous disease, uh, COPD, AFib, hypertension, and dementia. This was a chronic ulcer for two plus years, uh, very poor food and fluid intake. So the facility was challenged right from the start. And they uh, started the treatment protocol uh, pursuant to the wound hygiene uh, formulary with Aquacil AG Advantage covered with the Aquacil foam again, changing it every three days and as needed. So go, moving away from daily dressing changes. And this was you know, a patient who had really not necessarily been engaged uh, in their wound care, but once they saw the progress after two years of really not much, uh, they were compliant with the care plan. This is a pressure injury, a little difficult to see here, but um, Comorbidities here, diabetes, dementia, again, poor food and fluid. Uh, the patient really wasn't moving much, bed or the jerry chair, uh, required full assistance with turning and repositioning, which the patient, the resident wasn't really, you know, happy to comply with that. So didn't really like being turned onto that non-affected side. So the treatment protocol here uh, was uh, Aquacel AG Advantage covered with the Aquacel foam adhesive, again, changing three times a week and as needed. And the resident then became compliant with the care plan, not just the dressing changes, but certainly the uh, changes in positioning that were gonna help offload this pressure injury. You see here, in, kind of in the first uh, image, you're like, well, you, you, when you look across, you're like, hmm, I'm not sure what progress I'm seeing. But in that first image, there's an awful lot of inflammation uh, and, you know, caused by uh, you know, the, the bio burden that's in that wound. And adding the Aquacel AG Advantage there helped to, uh, to manage that and to get that wound uh, continuing to move forward. We did these over a short evaluation period of time, um, but I know that in talking to the nurse who was taking care of this resident that the wounds continue to improve. This is one of the home care patients. So this is a mixed arterial venous leg ulcer, uh, comorbidities of venous insufficiency, peripheral vascular disease, uh, also a smoker. Uh, there was just always, you know, slough, eschar, heavily draining wound. You see in the first image uh, the use of a, a barrier ointment to try to manage the effect of the moisture on that surrounding skin. So that treatment protocol uh, under uh, 
the complete program was changed to the Aquaslade G Advantage and, and Kavamac, which is a super absorber. And that became, you know, that was changed twice weekly. Uh, and that was from daily. So over the course of, uh, that you see here, these four months, the uh, going down from daily home care visits to two times a week was a 70% decrease in, in visits. There was, you see the progress over the four months, increased granulation tissue, you see epithelialization, you see that, uh, that surrounding skin looking very healthy, uh, as it, and, which is needed to get these, dress, uh, these wounds to close. So, and the patient also was, was very satisfied. Uh, it's, you know, it's very challenging for them to live with these wounds that, uh, you know, are heavily exudating and just, uh, you know, not moving. And so being able to see progress like this uh, was something that the patient was really very happy about. This is another home care patient. This is a venous uh, leg ulcer. Uh, the wound characteristics, very kind of poor quality granulation. You look at it as kind of like dull. It's not like what we like to see with granulation tissue. Moderate amount of drainage. And this was changed. Uh, the protocol here was also changed to the advantage. And compression was added uh, to the, the treatment plan. And you know, over the course of this month that we, we are looking at here, the number of dressing changes, i.e. nursing visits, decreased by a third. And there was a significant decrease in, in the drainage and increase in that epithelialization uh, in this venous leg ulcer. So just to wrap it all up, it really takes leadership to drive a comprehensive wound care program. And that has a lot of positive impacts for the facility, for the staff, for the patient resident population. Stacey mentioned, well, you know, why is the administrator engaged here? Well, because she is the end of the line. She is responsible for everything that happens in that facility. And wound care is a particularly, uh, you know, problem area that many entities will be looking at, whether it's a surveyor or whether it's the patient's families. And this project really demonstrated the necessity to simplify wound care protocols for those nurses who are taking care of these residents or patients. Uh, one of the things at, that really resonates with me is that empowerment, empowering the non-expert clinician to feel confident that they understand how to care for these wounds and can deliver predictable outcomes based on using uh, a simple formulary. The learning platform, again, you know, we, we can repeat, Stacy mentioned it as well, it's so critical. Um, particularly when you're dealing with staff that are very mobile <laughs> through uh, various uh, you know, home care agencies or skilled nursing facilities and being able to bring somebody in, even using agency staff, to be able to have access to on-demand, quick, here's a, you know, uh, a video on that product, or how to place that product. Um, and then that standardized approach is, can help facilities to reduce their nursing time. It helps them manage and deliver costs. So looking at the same consistent care that's provided you know, per wound type and using the same types of products and seeing improved patient outcomes uh, really is what the regulators are looking for. Uh, and you know, so this program has helped uh, Friendship Village uh, be able to achieve that. So thank you for your attention this morning. Uh, we'll open it up to questions. Um, and I'm going to start, though, with a question to Stacy because this is always a challenge. So how did you get your staff over the hump? Because you had some real resistors to, yeah, to the change. Sure. I think it's just that um, our leadership team had the buy-in, and they weren't wavering. And Sometimes, as I say, care is in a democracy, right? So we have to be intentional in what we're doing. And it does take time to prove that what we're saying is going to work is going to work. Now, I had no idea it would work this well. To be honest, I was blown away with the results. But once this, the nurses, and it just was reiterating the why and the purpose, and, and how this was going to increase quality of our residents and how it was gonna affect their use of nursing time throughout their course of their day. But as, as a leadership team, we couldn't waver with them. 
We had to stay the course and bring them along with us. And so that was really kind of our strategy because noise can make you want to waver, but you almost have to tune out and just stay the course. And, and now I feel like I've got, I mean, we have 30, 40 nurses that are all cheerleaders of the program. Um, so that, that was really pivotal for us. And the corollary to that, your medical director. Our medical director, um, every medical director is aware of the risk of accepting admissions with wounds and trying to manage them. And they can kind of get caught up in the nervousness of, of what if we have a negative outcome? What if we get cited? What if, well, what if we have a program that's going to empower you as a medical director just as much as, it, as our nurses? And so getting her buy-in was huge. And any time, because you know, nurses aren't gonna call me and ask to change a wound care order, right? They're gonna call the nurse. And so she reiterates our purpose and our why. And so they understand, well, I'm not, I can't call Dr. Brosh because she's not gonna give me what I want. And so eventually that noise goes away. But she was our big advocate as far as, no, you guys know we have a formulary, we have a care path here, follow the care path. And she really just reiterated that with the nurses, which is huge. Um, so, yes. Tracy Kimball, um, in of H. Pace, Denver, Colorado. Um, I function in a very similar uh, community-based uh, program. We have a hybrid multi-specialty um, wound care program, interdisciplinary team that has a health, home health extension, but many of our patients who start in their homes end up in a nursing home. And it's a challenge because I'm streamlining those care plans in the home, and once they go into a nursing home, then I lose that, um, that leverage. Um, how do, it's a pain point for us. And, and how does a program like mine empower the nursing facilities to adopt a program like this? Because it's essentially what we're doing in the community, and then having that plan follow them into the nursing homes where I don't have that discretion. Um, pairing with medical directors and having them understand this is a really critical pinch point for me. Um, I was that nurse practitioner last week calling and speaking with their DON and asking why are they changing protocols when the patient's been thriving at home but then went into a med A or a PDPM situation with the nursing home and the nursing home changed the protocol. It wasn't that they chose the wrong dressings necessarily, it was that they just didn't call and have a communication with the care team who had implemented a care plan that was working for the patient. So something like this sounds like a great option for a company like mine to pair and, and channel with you um, to get these nursing homes on board with that, that whole concept. Because we've standardized formulary, Lean Six Sigma, all of that, and we do have the same outcomes that you're showing um, on a grander scale in a community-based program. So um, I'd just like to hear your comments on how you actually rolled this out once again and, and um, and how are you working with your community partners and your community wound care centers and providers to, uh, to have this fluid? Well, I'll start. Uh, it really is a collaborative effort um, with Comatech. So if um, Stacy has a particular uh, you know, referral or, or you know, other entity that she's working with, we try to work with them to help introduce what the protocol is, what is it that's you know, happening in the nursing home, how is it consistent with you know, good practice. Um, and it's really, you can never over communicate. So it really it involves when you've got all of those disparate entities, you've got to try to communicate and over communicate and educate to the extent that you can. Um, we've, you know, we've done that um, with you know, some other uh, facilities as well to say, you know, well, we have a particular uh, provider or someone who is kind of ordering wet to dry dressings. How do we manage that? And so we collaborate with them to uh, provide education. You know, it looks, it's going to look different based on the situation, but certainly um, it's not just the nursing home's responsibility. Uh, we see it as something that we have to engage in as well to the extent that we can. And we use our interdisciplinary team uh, in Comatech to be able to have those conversations. Sometimes they're not successful, you know, but we do put the effort in uh, 
for you know the residents and the, and the patients because it's really about them. Um, so I, I, what we have found is that once you give them a little bit of education, they get it um, because many of them aren't wound care specialists, and so they don't know what they don't know. And putting together simple protocols, very easy, not only for your clinicians to understand it, but for uh, you know other. Uh, Doc, physicians, nurse practitioners, also okay. I, I understand what you're what you're doing here, and we're good. We can work together. Yeah, and to piggyback on that, we had an experience with we we sit in a pretty heavy managed care area um, with a pretty large physician group um, up the street, and so we worked very diligently um, advertising, educating our program. And I would venture to guess there's not many skilled nursing facilities that say, please pick. Send me all your wounds. I mean, people typically don't do that, right? Um, and so once we did the education, we did that with the physician at, at the office level, but we also did it at the contract level with the managed care company. And so after a lot of exchange and data, we now have carve-outs for our home health that essentially the doctors say, we want to just house these products in our building so that we're using the same thing we want you to be our provider of choice for our wound care so it's seamless in the transition. So we've been able to not only work at the physician level but also in the managed care that all these physicians participate so that we're trying to streamline um, all, all of the program through all the, all the hands, right? So at the physician office, they're using the same things. If they refer to home health, we can go and get the products from the physician office once again, consistency, or if they refer to us at the SNF level, we are using the same, the same formulary. Um, but it does take a lot of time to get their attention. But like I said, for a managed care company, if you show them reduction in cost and reduction of visits at the home level, you pretty much have their attention right there <laughs> to, uh, to move forward with conversation. Yeah, I will say the managed care payers in particular are data driven. And so if you can show them a cost savings, um, they get it right away. And they, I think part of the challenge for us as Convitec is to, you know, they're used to, managed care organizations are used to dealing with disease states, right? Diabetes, cardiac disease, they know that. They have all those clinical pathways. But what they don't have is, is that, you know, understanding that wounds that come out of these chronic disease, wound management really is, a disease management uh, part. And so working with the payers to help them along uh, to understand that and to understand you know, what, it, what is the program and how you know, are we going to be able to not only um, decrease your cost, but heal the wounds um, and, and lead to you know, patient or resident and family satisfaction as well. So it's, it's a win for, for all. I think we have time for one more. A yeah, quick question here about how do you manage diagnostics if you need diagnostics to assess the wounds and you have to send the patient out somewhere to get the ultrasound or Dopplers or what have you? We can do that internally. We have contracts that can do those services in-house. And if we needed to send them out for that, we certainly would. But we do have services that can come in and perform those tests. Well, that's all the time we have. Uh, thank you very much. Um, both Stacy and I will be uh, at the Comitech booth at 427 if you have any additional questions. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference.